Okay. This morning, I'm going to finish up three commandments. Sit tight. It's not going to be that bad. <coughs> Those of you who have been following along, we've gone through every commandment. But this morning, I want to read to you from the, the, the three final commandments that we have. And there's a similarity to them. And that's why last week we did two that were very similar in, uh, um, in, in how we can kill somebody. Now, these are about wanting. Okay? So in the Deuteronomy reading, it goes, Thou shalt not commit adultery, you shall not steal, and you shall not cover your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his manservant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, anything that is your neighbor's. The Exodus reading says it this way, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Those are both the same. But here the word usage gets a little different. You shall not cover your neighbor's house, nor shall you cover your neighbor's wife. Um, his male servant his female servant, his ox, his donkey, and anything that is in your neighbor. So there's a little bit of verb change there, but it's really basically, in, in essence, the, the same commandments. The writing is the same. <coughs> this is what the Book of Common Prayer says. If you go into you before the service here, into the, the Decalogue, it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not covet. Which really, in essence, is what we're talking about here. Wanting. Right? We want something that's not ours. You know, we think that the grass is greener, but Irma Bombeck said the grass is only greener over the septic tank. And that's the reality of it. It states it so plainly in the Book of Common Prayer that we don't even pay it any heed, but I think what the Book of Common Prayer is, is saying is you don't even need to worry about specifically lining out, well, you can cover everything but his Mercedes Benz. It just says, don't covet anything that the Lord has not given you. There's so many people that run around, oh, I wish I had children like that. And, and that's their life, is looking around at other people saying, I want a life like Mr. Spinat's. As the great prophet, the great prophet, Howard Timmons once said after his wife had passed away, he says, my life stinks, but if I put my problems on the table with everybody else's, I would still take the death of my wife back compared to everybody else's problems. And if you think about it for a little bit, you, you, that is coveting in many ways. When we look at saying, I'm tired of my problems, I want better. I want to live a life like this person or that person. And I think Howard, and, and, and again, you all know Howard and what a dear saint of the church he is. This was devastation to him, to lose his wife. That he, I mean, they were teenage sweethearts, and to lose her so young. But he had a reality check that he, he was, this was what God had given him, and he wasn't going to covet a better life of anybody else's. He had to deal with what God had given him. And I think we all should learn from how, on how to deal with what God has given us. Think about it. How many problems do you have in your life? And you look around. I mean, church is, is, is superficial sometimes. Everybody comes in with a happy church face. Oh, I'm so happy. You know, Father's here. We're going to hear a, 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 a quaint sermon for, hopefully he'll keep it under 15 minutes. And, and you know, and it, 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 you go through all this stuff and you look around and it, and, and nobody shows the real pain that they're in. Nobody shows the addictions that they're in. Nobody shows the problems that their families have posed upon them. We put on a happy church face. But the reality is when we go home, we, we just open up the closet like, ah. And that's where the psalm comes in. My help is in the Lord. So we need to stop looking around thinking that we can find a better life than what we got. Our son Will is enthralled with the idea of owning a Porsche. He has no job. Dad doesn't make, I mean, you all know how much I don't make, so, you know, I'm not seeing this coming into the future anytime soon unless there's a windfall of some, you know, distant relative that I'd forgotten completely about. and and. We were talking about this yesterday as we were driving up to see our, uh, uh, my father-in-law. 
They said, well, I really love this car. And I said, well, that's cool. But the idea is that if you're going to love that car, you better have enough for the maintenance on it. I know plenty of men that I went to high school with that married the, the, the beautiful wife. Didn't care about the personality, just wanted the arm candy. And then the maintenance came for the arm candy. Right? The maintenance came. Couldn't afford the maintenance. Could afford the car, but couldn't afford the maintenance. This is all part of coveting. We want things with our screwed up vision. We know that we're fallen by nature, so our vision is screwed up. It is. It is. We always want to look to the celebrities, thinking our life stinks, so I'm going to look at the celebrities, and then we realize they're just as bad as we are. But the problem is, is half of us, in our desire to look at celebrities, we allow it to happen, that their life gets exposed that money and so forth gets put out there to see that Leslie Snipes owes more in taxes than I do. I could care less who pays what in taxes, but that's out there in the celebrity news. And people want to know, they want to, you know, they want to feel good about their lives. They want, they want, they want everything that's here on earth, but never anything that's heavenly. Never the things that are giftly, that are going to have eternal consequences to it. Every funeral, I don't care when or who or for what, it's always the same when we do Psalm 23. Do we really listen to the words when, this, when we say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's going to give me everything. How many of you know of a sparrow or a robin that's running around robbing convenience stores? How many of them? It's all about want. We have teenagers now that don't want to go through the time and trial of life and going to college and getting an education. And instead, they go to a life of crime to get that BMW fast. So somebody like Jack has to deal with them. Because they want. Not what they're given, but they want. You remember when the film Scarface came out? All of a sudden, everybody wanted an M16 because it was so cool seeing him shoot up. What do you think of my little friend now and shooting up in that? Those of you that are in the military know that the M14 was the best weapon ever go. But because people wanted a lighter weapon, we got this piece of junk called an M16. Couldn't hit the broadside of a barn with a sack of rice with the thing. But the other weapon was heavier. That was the only problem with it. But it could shoot underwater. You could drag it through mud in Vietnam, and that weapon was going to fire every time. But the M16, you get a speck of dust inside that chamber. You better be throwing the rifle at the enemy, because that's the only thing that's going to hit him. It ain't going to fire. All because people want it. But our want should be in the Lord. And you see those people that understand this. Their lives are less complicated. Proverbs. Proverbs says this. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what they should give and only suffers from want. Only suffers from want. How many of you out there, when you saw somebody begging on the streets, if you gave them money, you went broke afterwards? Really? <laughs> I've given money away freely and I know something happened and I got money the next day. I mean, over here in Philadelphia, they got a press that prints up new stuff all the time, too. Right? Have you ever gone to that point? But Proverbs is saying this, your want <coughs> should not be what it is that you give off of, but that you give freely of God and your want will be already taken care of. So don't worry about that. The birds don't worry about that. Why should you? Jesus says this in, in Matthew 20. He says, And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside, and they heard that Jesus was passing by, and they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. 
The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But these two guys yelled out even more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus stopped and he called to them and said, What do you want from me? And they said, Lord, we don't want money. We don't want the newest chariot. We just want our eyes opened so that we can see. And Jesus took pity on them. He touched their eyes and immediately they received their sight and followed him. Their want was not in material items. It was just the simple basic thing that we need and we take for granted. You don't think some of our parishioners who are hard of hearing right now just want to have ears that can hear or eyesight that can see? I know one of our parishioners that sits in a room all day with no eyesight and it's the worst thing to see how lonely she is. Sometimes our want gets in our way. And we always screw up. What we want always screws us up. Look at the trial of Jesus Christ. Simple one. We all read it every time on Good Friday. Our want, when Pilate says, who shall I give to you? Did they want the Lord Jesus Christ back? No. What did we want? A robber. A murderer. We wanted Barabbas. Instead of the king of kings and lord of lords, the man who had healed the blind. We wanted somebody that stole more of want. So I want you to start, as as I get ready to leave here, and, and to think about how ministry needs to be done by you, the people here in the church. I want you to listen to what St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. When he says, now I commend to you because you remembered me in everything and maintained traditions even as I delivered them to you. This is me talking to you then. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of every wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. That's a want. I want you to understand that Christ has got to be the center of everything in your life. Or your want is only for you. If you do something in the church, it's not that you want recognition. It's not that you want glory. It's that you want to further the kingdom of God. That should be the only reason you do anything to anybody is not for self-glory. It's not for what you want to receive from them, but rather what you want from God to bless you at the end of your life or to bless your life while you're here. Now going on the opposite side of this, if in these three commandments (coughs) you find yourself guilty of coveting, stealing, Adultery. I know many couples that we've come that have come to me in counseling have said, "Well, I can forgive everything but adultery." Really, you have set up such a bad scenario then, if that's all you can forgive for everything but that. So, meanwhile, Mr. Spinatz can go out and murder a family of six, and that's forgivable. But if he has an affair with Mrs. Bag of Donuts, you're not going to forgive him for that? When we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, Father, we want you to forgive us like we've forgiven others. Do you really want that? Do you really, really want to believe that you can't forgive when somebody screws up? We are all fallen by nature, and we all screw up. Anybody that walks through these doors saying, well, I've never done that. Well, Jesus says, if your eye does it, you've done it. If all of a sudden you see Rachel McClish, now I'm showing my age. When was she a bodybuilder in the early 80s? She was like the first female bodybuilder. And everybody had her posters up on the walls of the barracks. I mean, she, we didn't even want to mess with her. She was tough. But if you looked at her and you said, wow, oh, she's gorgeous. I get to say, wow, God really created a beautiful woman there. 
and it, it will further his kingdom through her beautiful body. No. That's coveting. That's adultery by just looking at it and thinking that way. It may not be the physical act, but it was an act here, wasn't it? How many women have seen, give me a name, Banderas? There's a good one. Anthony Banderas. Or for some of you older ladies, Sean Connery. Let's talk early James Bond on who had an affair. Right or wrong? But the idea is this. That is adultery. Point blank. So we need to watch when somebody steals from us. How can we forgive that? We need to watch when somebody covets something or when we covet something of somebody else's. And we need to repent of that and move on. Don't sit there and dwell on it every single day. The Lord's forgiven you. If you have truly come to him and repented, the Lord has forgiven you. Now it's all in your head. Move on. Don't get yourself wrapped up in the axles. But if you find yourself in a position where coveting, adultery, or stealing are tempting you, then you need to change your ways. You need to get yourself out of that temptation way so that it won't happen again. If you're the receiver, if stuff has been stolen from you or, or stuff has been coveted of yours or you've been, you've been cheated on by a spouse or a loved one, then you need to learn how to forgive as Jesus forgave. And you're going to make your relationship that much stronger. My wife puts every Sunday or every day, she puts something from Love Dare on Facebook, those of you that have us on Facebook. And every one of them in there goes to that same cross, that same vow that, yeah, it's tough to be married. There are things in relationships we do wrong, but we need to forgive each other for when we screw up. So I just pray that you'll learn this Christ-like forgiving so that God doesn't hold it against you saying, well, I'll never forgive you for anything but this. No. If you want to be a better Christian, you better learn how to forgive for everything. Everything. Just as God forgives you when you put idols before him, he forgives you and welcomes you back. Like that father on the road, he runs to you every time and puts the best cloak on you, puts rings on your fingers, and he kills the fatted calf for you. He loves you that much that he forgives you every time. You need to be the same way with each other and to forgive each other. Especially me. Forgive me if I've screwed up somehow with you. But I never meant to. So figure out how to do that. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.